Then we remind you of the events in the coming days. On Friday, we have uh, a lunchtime flu given by Adam Kobrinsky, our contractual fellow, who is right here. And Adam will be talking about renormalization group explanations in particle physics. So if you want to hear about renormalization, please join us on uh, Friday for that uh, talk. On Tuesday next week, we have a guest, Mathias Michel, who is a um, French philosopher of cognitive science right now at uh, NYU. And he will be talking about validity, validity drifts in psychiatric research. So um, uh, also looking for that, uh, looking forward to that lecture. Uh, on uh, the weekend uh, next week, we have to remind you one more time, the Space Time Functionalism Conference. The program is now online. So if you want to know who is talking when, you can just go to the website and find out uh, the schedule of the conference. Next, it's my uh, great pleasure to uh, introduce Megan Page, uh, who is a bit nervous, uh, 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 but who is associate professor at uh, Loyola Lola University, uh, Maryland. She, as uh, many of you know, she got her PhD here at the University of Pittsburgh, Department of Philosophy. And the reason why she's nervous is that two of her mentors are right now in, in the room, Bob, Bob and Mark. So you haven't seen me give a talk since my job talk. So that's an interesting <laughs> set of circumstances. Uh, um, uh, anyway, uh, Megan uh, uh, does a lot of work in philosophy of science. Uh, she works on uh, historical sciences, modeling, and also on climate science. We can hear a little bit about some of this topic here uh, today, but she also does some work on the philosophy of religion, indeed, she has published widely in the philosophy of uh, religion. And uh, she has been, I believe, still is uh, the PI of a Templeton funded large grant that tries to bring together both uh, philosophy of science, science, and philosophy of religion. It's called Set Foundations, amazing pun, if you know Megan. Uh, it's quite amazing, she, she did manage to put the pun. It's the title of a temple that for the drive. Oh, and she's really quiet, remarkable. <laughs> um, um, anyway, I don't know whether the grant is still ongoing. Yeah, it wraps up in July. In July, so a few, a few, a few more months for this um, uh, grant. And Megan has been with us at the center for the whole year. A really on having us here. Megan, the is yours. All right, thanks. Yes, well, there is a pun in this title too, but you might not get to it till the end. Um, and it's also really funny because this image, I just like typed in the name and hit designer and it popped up this image for the title page, but it also sort of speaks to the talk in a way that you'll see at the end. So thank you, AI. All right. So I'm gonna talk about a novel perspective on pluralism and climate modeling. And the last time I gave a talk at the center in the fall, I feel like I might've erred on the overly technical side. So my plan today is to err on the other side, um, err in a very different direction. And this is new stuff that I have not really talked about yet all together. So this is sort of previewing some new stuff that I've been thinking about while I've been at the center. But also it goes back to stuff that I think was rattling around in the back of my head when I was here as a graduate student, but I've sort of felt it stirring up again. All right, so an overview for this talk. I'm gonna start out with some of the background ideas, like the questions in my mind motivating the talk. Then I'm gonna go through a case study about not eliminable pluralism in models of the Permian Triassic extinction. Then we're gonna to journey to Mikhail Bakhtin's account of novel stylistics from uh, literary theory. And then I'll hand wave towards some conclusions by means of cool art. So that is the plan. Uh, buckle up. All right, background ideas. So in the background, I'm thinking about pluralism, as a lot of people are in philosophy of science right now. And I'm going to give a definition of pluralism that is not meant to be definitive. It's just meant to fix your intuitions on what I'm thinking about when I talk about pluralism. So I take pluralism to occur in any context where the sum of knowledge we have about some target relies on at least two distinct epistemic devices. Yeah, I'm making that term up. I just wanted something where you could swap it out with like, you might mean two different models, two different theories, two different scales, whatever. Uh, and we can't reduce the number of epistemic devices without reducing the quantity of knowledge. And I'm using terms like quantity and summation here very loosely and analogically, but the idea is we have some way of knowing about something, but our knowledge about that thing relies on two different devices and we can't 
get rid of any of them without reducing the amount of knowledge we have. So one question you might have in these pluralistic contexts is, what is the metaphysical structure of the world such that it gives rise to pluralism? Like, why is it such, why do we have pluralism? What is the world like such that we get these pluralistic accounts? Or you might wonder like, will this pluralism remain forever? Is it inherent to science? Um, those are questions you can wonder about but they're not the questions that I'm wondering about. So in geoscience, you live in this like weird epistemic domain where it seems quite plausible that the end of the world will come before the end of science. And so like in trying to answer those scientific questions, there is this sense of pressure of not thinking about like where will we ultimately end up someday, but how do we move forward or how do we make good decisions in the context that we're in now? How do we use science well or think well um, in scientific context. And so the question that I'm interested in is this more limited question, which is what do we do when we have pluralism? So like, what should we do in pluralistic context? How do we solve what I take to be kind of cross-cutting scientific problems in scenarios where we have epistemic devices that seem to disagree? So it's a much more practical question about this. All right, so I'm gonna talk also in the background here is Helen Longino's non-eliminable pluralism. So she says that different approaches to a phenomenon can provide different kinds of knowledge about it, all of which are relative to the causal space that they've carved. So she's talking about, in studying human behavior, she's talking about, no surprises here, behavior. And in particular, two kinds of human behavior that have been really politicized. So sexuality and aggression. Aggression being politicized as how it has to do with race. Um, and she sort of concludes we have all these different ways of studying behavior. People don't even mean the same thing by behavior. Yes, they're dealing with the same world and probably same causal space, but they're carving it up so differently. Uh, but she also thinks, you know, if we summed the way that they're causing or carving up the causal space, it's not like we're going to get to one, right? So it's not like here's the car causal space and we have each nicely apportioned the part that we will study. It's much messier. People are cross-cutting. People are combining measurements. You can't really get these different theories to talk to each other. And she says, the kind of knowledge afforded by the approaches is not like pieces of a puzzle that combine to make a complete and coherent picture. Instead, knowledge claims must be conditioned on particular parsings of the causal space. So I know a lot of people here don't like Longino's non-eliminable pluralism. Um, I, we got a big discussion about this in reading group last semester, and I defended her because I hadn't read it. And <laughs> that's usually when I defend things. Um, but I have read a lot more of it, and I'm still going to kind of defend her. I'm going to disagree with her some, but also I think she's making a weaker claim than people sometimes interpret her to be making. And so I've emphasized this non-eliminable pluralism is the view that some plurality is of the ineliminable sort. And importantly, of the incommensurable approaches sort. I think this is important because as soon as you say incommensurability, people get like worried. Okay, so non eliminative pluralism <laughs> is an attitude towards that plurality of incommensurables, an attitude focusing on the different kinds of knowledge each approach can offer rather than assuming that one at most is correct. It has the advantage of allowing us to see what kind of knowledge can be generated by what kind of methods. So, I think sometimes people are resistant to this because they take it as a very strong normative claim um, that we need to preserve pluralism or something like that. I don't, I don't read it that strongly in part because she's just saying there's some of like, I don't think it's a claim about how science always ought to be. It's just going to arise in some cases. And there's some cases where we should take this kind of attitude and focus on different approaches. And I'll talk about a positive sense of that. Oh, before I get there. So she also talks about um, two challenges for this non-eliminable pluralism. These are raised by Longino herself. One is going to be, what can it mean to say that two or more approaches are correct if they assign different and incompatible values to the same parameter? So what do we even mean when we talk about knowledge in a pluralist context? And two, how do we design scientifically informed intervention and policy? And this is the question that I'm most interested in in the face of multiple and prima facie incompatible research approaches emphasizing different causal factors or combinations. And her solution to both of these is basically to invoke pragmatism and say, oh, well, you know, our research is always constructed towards particular research problems and we carve up the space in a way that's amenable to our problem. 
And that allows us to have knowledge that is good for the problem relative to the problem. And it also helps us have the right kind of knowledge to make policy. And so this has gotten some significant uptake in geoscience in ways that I don't disagree with. I feel like it's helpful for understanding aspects of geoscience. So um, there's a lot of pluralism there, a lot of seeming incommensurability. It's you're working with like tons of data. And so Lisa Bukulich, for example, appeals to Longino in her work on this thing about the iconic conception. And here she's trying, she's in a disagreement with Craver. Um, and she's kind of trying to say, look, in geoscience, it's not about getting model to world fit. We have lots of different models of something even as simple as water. Um, we just have really fundamentally different models of water that are useful in different contexts. You're not going to get the one right fit, but these different models, her argument is like they're still useful for different kinds of explanation. And I think that kind of approach, um, that sort of, it fits with this general pragmatic adequacy for a purpose view, which is very popular in geoscience. Um, and I think for, you know, again, for good reasons, it makes sense. It bothers me a little bit sometimes. Um, and so some of the worries that I have about adequacy for purpose, again, I am sympathetic to it to a point, but I start worrying because one, I feel like it's just false that we always have unique experiments to precisely deal with our practical interests. That's not how policy works. Like it's often the case when you're making policy that you have to draw from a body of research, which has was not like created or investigated specifically to the particular problem that you're solving. Um, so I think that is a bit of an overgeneralization about adequacy for purpose. I also think lots of our practical interests cross cut our models or epistemic devices, and those devices may disagree. Um, now, Longino is looking at a problem like this in the human behavior case because she's worried about nature versus nurture, and these different theories are saying different things about it. And she's like, well, you know, you just have to make your questions smaller or not ask these general questions. It's a bad question. But I think even if you make your question more precise, and I'll try to show this in a minute, a lot of times you're going to get cross cutting. You're just, you're not going to have one epistemic device that gives you the answer. You're going to have different epistemic devices that are incommensurable and disagree on a topic. And so what do you do there? Uh, also, I think of adequacy for a purpose as it's emerged as kind of a response to this view that scientific knowledge has to be ontological knowledge. You're not really getting scientific knowledge unless you're getting ontological knowledge or responding to people who think that a model is only explanatory if you get like isomorphism between model and the world. And adequacy for a purpose was designed to push back on that. I think that was like its original intention and I'm sympathetic to it. Um, but if you leave those questions aside, like if you're like, yeah, sure, uh, that's true about modeling. I think we're still left with a lot of other really interesting questions about how scientific inference works in pluralistic contexts. And I don't think you can punt to adequacy for purpose there because it's just way too coarse grained. Um, like what is to be adequate for what purpose and kind of like, what do we mean? And how are the purposes actually interacting with the experiments? So again, I just, yeah, I think it's, not well fit for the kinds of pragmatic questions about inference that I'm interested in. And so then related to three, I just tend to worry whenever we go down this road, it feels a bit too disunified to me. All, you, you always have this worry that we're like denying the relatedness, the physical relatedness of our epistemic devices. Like, yes, we've constructed these different ways to look at the world, but we're still kind of looking at one world and we're often trying to get one answer or one policy or one solution. And so in a sense, I'm a big like, yeah, let a thousand flowers bloom kind of person. But sometimes we've got to pick a bouquet. <laughs> and so so in those contexts, it's like, what do you do? How do you put together a bouquet? All right. So I have this last worry, which is, I don't know if it, it could just be a personal worry that comes out of me being like a Longino fangirl or something or out of my own work. And it does come, it actually comes in a very personal way out of reading group last semester where I said, I said like, oh, you can still have transformative criticism even if you think theories are incommensurable. And everyone looked at me like I was crazy, which to be fair happens every reading group, but usually because I made a bad joke. <laughs> and so I really was like, is this, a, is this a crazy view? You know, and it made me wonder like, what's behind this page? Like, what are you thinking? So I kind of wanted to draw that out of it, at least for myself. Um, 
to see if I was missing something. But so, all right, so you can have this worry once Longino introduces non-eliminable pluralism, like, well, what about transformative criticism? Does it cease to exist in cases of non-eliminable pluralism? Is it just useless in these contexts? And this worry kind of emerges from Longino's claim that non-eliminable pluralism is an attitude focusing on the different kinds of knowledge each approach can offer rather than assuming that one at most is correct. So it's sort of this attitude where it like stop trying to make these agree or disagree and just listen to what they have to say about what they're talking about. But transformative criticism kind of seems to require a different attitude, right? One that assumes, well, I shouldn't say incommensurable here, but it's gonna have to assume that theories can interact in some important way. Uh, if you don't know what transformative <laughs> criticism is, this comes from Longino's first book, Science of Social Knowledge. And there she was sort of kind of confronting this problem that all of our theory is radically underdetermined by data and you know the gap between, it's like you can't just look at the evidence to theory relation because what even counts as evidence tends to be really social phenomenon. And so she had this view that scientific knowledge is social knowledge. We should be looking more at the social activity of science and understanding how scientific knowledge gets formed rather than just focusing on the kind of theory to world relation. And she introduced criticism, uh, like this idea of transformative criticism as a way that you sort of transform individual subjective perspectives into this more objective standard through scientific dialogue. Um, and I think this was like, I mean, this was transformative. It was a really new way of thinking about things. It kind of encouraged us to measure the health of science or the health of knowledge, the quality of knowledge by the health of the community that's producing it, which I think was transformative and really important and something that I think about a lot as a community organizer. Um, all, you know, it changes the focus from the, like just the kind of abstract theory to world relation to the process relation. What's the process that goes into making science? How is it happening? And so Longino kind of called people to evaluate science by what does the scientific community look like that's producing this? And also like, if you find yourself sometimes trapped in conversations about how do we know real science from conspiracy? And it can be very hard to answer that question. Um, even if you think there's a clear answer, in a dialogue, it can be hard to answer that question sometimes by trying to appeal to stuff about theory world relations. <laughs> but you can sometimes really push on this in a different direction and be like, look at the communities that are producing this, the kind of relationships between them, how those social forces drive things and stuff. So, um, so what was transformative criticism? There were these sort of four features by which you could evaluate it. Are there public venues for criticism? Do you get uptake of criticism? Do you have publicly recognized standards for evaluating theories and hypotheses and practices? And is there a kind of tempered equality of intellectual authority? So do you have, are you offering power to different voices? And is that part of your community such that your theories aren't being like implicitly biased in one direction, right? Like all of the biases get their space and get to sort of converse among each other. So, Okay, so what is this worry? That might not be a worry for anyone but me, but it's there, so I'll put it out here. So if it turns out different perspectives are just incommensurable, does that mean that they can't talk to or transform each other? Is there no space for this kind of mutual transformation? Um, and do we really lose this more social picture of scientific interaction? Or at least we just say, well, it happens in sub-disciplines, but not at this like more meta level, right? We kind of box people into, you do your scientific research, I do mine. They're just different things, and there's no real overarching scientific community. Uh, and I kind of wonder, like, isn't there a kind of scientific knowledge that should be more than just its unsellable parts, right? So, like, can you grant, yes, we have this division, and the division doesn't sum to one, there's not puzzle pieces, but we also have a kind of knowledge that emerges from the collection of those different parts, even if it's not, even if it doesn't emerge like a puzzle fitting together. What would that look like? All right, so now I want to illustrate this with a case study and talk about the Permian Triassic event for a bit. So the Permian Triassic event is like the largest known extinction. It happened approximately 252 million years ago. Um, it was thought to be caused by a warming event that was caused by an increase in CO2, which was likely triggered by volcanic eruptions. But you might see why this particular extinction has been of interest to scientists now, because they, we want to understand okay, 
bump up the CO2 levels, things start to break down, we know that, but you want to know at what point, right? Like what point do they start to break down and how do they start to break down? And what are the mechanisms by which you get these mass extinctions? Because if we understand those mechanisms better, there might be space for potential interventions that we can make along the way, right? So um, what specific kind of breakdown happened? And we can't just study that theoretically by like fixing some initial conditions and then running our models because there's so many factors that play into these kinds of breakdowns that we don't know. So one way to study it is by historical analogy, right? Like go, we find this case in the history of the earth where we think there was a big warming event and let's try to figure out what happened. And that might give us some clues of where we should be looking as we experience warming now to see where the breakdown might start and places where we might try to hedge against it. That's kind of the idea here. Okay, so um, I've talked before many times about proxy data. <laughs> so proxy data is this data that you can collect from different fossils or macro fossils or sediments, this kind of stuff. And you can kind of piece together something like records uh, of the times when the extinction happened. And but the data by itself is like very sparse and it's hard to interpret it. And so to interpret this kind of data, you often want to put it inside some kind of a climate model. And that's how you construct a narrative. Um, and then you can kind of, you get like, you have some sense of the dynamics of the system and how they move. That's built into your model. You combine it with your proxy data then you test it against some proxy data. You kind of try to build a trajectory or a story out of this data about what did, what happened in the past. But, um, you have to make a choice of what kind of model you're going to use. There's lots of different choices, and those choices have significant trade-offs. And I'm just going to focus on like one, the choice between two kinds of models here. So one modeling approach you might take is an atmospheric ocean general circulation model. And these are like very big models. They're basically the kind of models you have at NCAR, something that we're using to do climate models now for like the big like CMIP projects. Um, they're very complex and accurate. Uh, they And what we mean usually by accuracy is they involve models. The coding is insane. Okay, big models, lots of lower scale processes in detail, but they require a lot of power. So, I mean, you almost never run these models for more than 3,000 year periods. Throughout your, the reconstruction is 3,000 years long. You're running it for like a month or something. But, um, <laughs> but it's like, so what you can get out of these is a lot of information about complex causal processes that go all the way down to very small scales. Not all, not everything, but whatever. Uh, but you can get a short time period. There's also Earth system models of intermediate complexity. And what you're doing there is you pick a few processes that you care about, like maybe you care about the interaction of a few particular processes, and you can run them for a really long time. So these are much lower resolution models. You're not getting as much detail out of them, but you can run them for like 100,000 years. Again, that's the reconstruction is 100,000 years. And um, what you are really doing is like focusing on how a couple processes over a long period of time interact rather than this like holistic picture of many processes. So which model is best? Well, depends on what you want to know, right? If you want to know something about what happened over a million years or 100,000 years. I mean, the time scale for something like the Permian Triassic event is going to be over 100,000 years, really. It's like a very, the process takes a long time. So you're going to want something like an EMIC, kind of, because it also depends on how stable or sensitive you think your target system is to lower scale processes. Because you know that when you've chosen the EMIC, you're going to get a long time story, but you've ignored certain feedbacks. Um, I mean, it's also going to depend on really pragmatic things like how much time, money, data you have, kind of like your kind of access to these models, um, what they're being used for, et cetera. So I'm going to talk about the Eusinia hypothesis. And this is one hypothesis that arose about uh, possible breakdowns for the Permian-Triassic event. And so the paleo data suggests that the increased CO2 brought about big changes in the ocean. That's potentially one way that the extinction gets fueled. Um, the hypothesis is that you there's increased weathering from the warming of the rocks, then you've got more runoff, um, and then you get a eucinic ocean. That just means there's low oxygen because everything in the ocean is working so hard to break down the nutrients that are coming from the additional runoff. And you get high toxic hydrogen sulfide, which is from the sulfate bacteria that are growing to compensate for 
the low oxygen and you get this toxic ocean basically and then everything in the ocean starts dying and, and it's like a feedback process because then the chemicals change even more and and then because the ocean is like a feeder of all life right that's part of how you're getting mass extinction so that's the hypothesis so here's two different investigations of that hypothesis one gets run on an emic uh, and there, the kind of interest is in how much phosphate is required to drive oceanic isonia. So it's very much like a tipping point study, um, like kind of comparing the talk, like the levels in our ocean now, and then try to extract some levels from the proxy data and sort of like, well, what would we need to get using the ocean? Um, and what the study found was that increasing to three times the current levels could make the ocean toxic enough for this kind of an extinction event. And that was the conclusion. All right, so that was 2008. So then in 2012, um, Wingeth and Wingeth one ran, ran a very like similar experiment, but on a different model on one of these really complex models. And they also increased the phosphate levels but did not see significant changes, even with increasing them 10 times. And that was, um, well, when they added in a biological pump, so you can, in the model, say like, and also pump some additional carbon in here, then they could get usinia, right? But they couldn't get it without that, even increasing the phosphate levels to 10 times. So it seemed like pretty strong model disagreement. Um, and really what they're di di like disagreeing about is how much weathering is required to create using an ocean. But again, it's hard because these models are operating on such different scales. Um, and, and again, so this is leading to larger disagreement about how likely it is that this was the trigger of the extinction event. Because um, then you have questions about like, well, depending on how much we think we need, was there enough weathering? Is that a reasonable hypothesis? But part of what's hard here is like, you can say, well, in the lower, like we have this detailed model and you, you put a bunch of phosphate in there, you don't get it. So probably the lower scale processes matter here and we're only seeing it in the long range because we don't have those lower scale processes. But you don't really know that because it could also be that the dynamic feedback effects over a long period of time are what really drive up the possibility of this, right? Because like it is a dynamic feedback event. So you're kind of stuck in this position where you have two models, they're telling you kind of different stuff but they're completely different. I mean, they've carved up the causal space totally differently. They've treated the data totally differently. They have different strengths and weaknesses. I think this is a good example of the kind of pluralism that Longino is talking about. And, and, and I think we have we want to say, like, but which model is correct or more trustworthy? And here's a quote from Oreskes where she says, the attempt to make models capture the complexities of natural systems leads to a paradox. The more we strive for realism by incorporating as many possible as possible of the different processes and parameters that we believe to be operating in the system, the more difficult it is for us to know if our tests of the model are meaningful. And this is a big problem when you're using the complex models to do paleo data, because you also have to realize that these models are sort of developed and calibrated for the kinds of data that we have now, which is like massive amounts of data that we use to drive these models. And like the paleo data is very sparse. So we're setting a lot of stuff in the models to zero and doing some heavy interpretation even when we introduce the data. And you just don't know how that changed. Sorry, so I'm speaking against, maybe you have an intuition and I used to have this intuition, which is why I have this in this paper, but I don't have this intuition as much anymore. So maybe you don't, but maybe you have an intuition that like, well, the complex model is obviously more reliable. But I think that's not true because you're introducing other kinds of modeling problems when you move to this higher level of complexity and those problems are amplified in the historical case. So you really have two competing models that I think are, you know, fair competitors. Okay, so this disagreement, it's rooted in, in like a difference in research questions. Um, one's concerned with like how significant weathering over a long period is gonna lead to extinction. One's concerned with how contribution from weathering interacts with these other small scale processes on a short time scale. Uh, one's about tipping points and thresholds. The other's more about understanding causal complexity in the world. And yet it feels like these interact in some sense, right? This is where I wanna push for unity. Like I feel like they're very much about the same hypothesis and about a historical event that bears some kind of ontological unity. Um, I use that word lightly, but there is this, pull towards that. At least I feel it. Okay, so I think this case exemplifies Longino's non-eliminable pluralism, different approaches that start with a different way of carving up causal space. But does this mean their apparent disagreement is not meaningful because they're incommensurable? 
right? Can we even really say that these models disagree because they've been constructed so differently? And, and if we can't, then how do they even contribute to our assessment of this hypothesis? Have we just got like a zero gain in our knowledge? Have we learned nothing? Was this whatever? Um, so that's kind of the questions that I'm asking in these parts. Like, do we have conflicting evidence, no evidence, evidence for two different hypotheses? How do we make sense of this? All right, so now I'm gonna uh, turn to Mikhail Bakhtin's account of novel stylistics. So please follow me down the rabbit hole because like any rational person, I think the way to answer these questions is through 20th century literary analysis. Um, so who is Mikhail Bakhtin? Well, he was around from 1895 to 1975. These are the sort of interesting gems I found from putting this paper together. So he was a Russian literary theorist that was interested in the philosophy of language, a self-proclaimed philosopher. Uh, he was arrested by the secret police and put in exile, which is where he wrote the essay that I'm going to rely on most in my analysis. But he became even pro more prolific after that because his leg was amputated in 1938, at which point he wrote a dissertation in literary theory uh, that took nine years to for him to defend. The first few years, it was the war. But then for three years, there was a huge row in the department over half of the people wanted to pass it, half of the people didn't. The row was so big and unsolvable that the government had to get involved. Um, and he was ended up being awarded a lesser degree than he had applied for. But he introduced, I, yeah, I feel like as academics, we can appreciate that story. But he introduced a number of terms and concepts that became crucial in literary theory. So I'm just going to sort of introduce these a bit to give you a background for the kind of framework we're thinking about before I go to the more specific text I want to look at. So he was thinking about this idea of polyphony in literature, which is very much like in music, where you get um, polyphonic symphonies, and that's going to be a case like, so contrary to where you have like one melody and then the accompaniment, right? In a polyphonic situation, you might have multiple melodies, or you might be exchanging the melody back and forth uh, on different sides of the accompaniment, like or like so it goes from right hand to left hand and back again. This kind of exchange. So it's a sort of a different structure in music than traditional melody and accompaniment. And so in literature, he took the polyphony to be a decentered authorial stance that grants validity to all voices. And uh, this was to be held in tension with or distinct from a kind of monologic where you think there's a fixed word to world relation that exists independently of the speakers in the context. So it's a very contextualist picture. Uh, when the view that he wants to reject this monologic, he thinks of as disembodied truth or no man's thoughts or a god's eye view, right? We hear this all the time, the god's eye view of the world. So that's the monologic. All right, so instead he wants to focus on a kind of dialogue or dialogism, which is aimed at generating truth, not just dialogue that's arguing over which monologic is the right one, but a truly generative dialogue. And it's rooted in this notion of unfinalizability, according to which the world is a kind of work in progress. So Nothing conclusive has yet taken place in the world. The ultimate word of the world and about the world has not yet been spoken. The world is open and free. Everything is still in the future and will always be in the future. Um, and I like to think I'm the first person who has ever quoted Bakhtin in this room, but who knows? Okay, so uh, now I'm going to give you this kind of Wikipedic view of Russian formalism because that exhausts my knowledge of Russian formalism. Um, I'm not a literary theorist, but this is the background to which Bakhtin was responding. And so it's based on a distinction between form and content and thought of as this scientific method for studying language, really poetry, and, and really studying the form of poetry. And the way it, it works, so you've got two general principles that underlie the formalist study of literature. First, literature itself, or rather those of its features that distinguish it from other human activities must constitute the object of inquiry of literary theory, Second, literary facts have to be prioritized over the metaphysical commitments of literary criticism, whether philosophical, aesthetic, or psychological. Um, I'm smiling because this just gives me such like positivist vibes, right? Like this is this very much feels like the kind of literary positivism. And the goal here was to define poetic language. So they're trying to understand how does meaning work in poetry? And it's like, well, you have the meaning that's fixed by the terms relation to the world, and that's kind of ordinary language. And then in poetry, you do a stylistic deviation from that. And so that stylistic deviation is going to contribute to the meaning in the poem. That's kind of the idea. And so 
the formalists are like, great, we'll look at the form. There's going to be very rigorous deviations. We can look at that kind of standard language to poetic language deviation, study that, and understand how it works in poetry. So in Discourse in the Novel, Bakhtin is responding to that and does so by just objecting at bottom to the form content distinction. And, and the reason he does this is on the basis of the novel. The pun, it's creeping up on you. Okay, <laughs> so uh, he complains that this account of stylistic can't accommodate the novel and instead treats the novel, like the tendency there was to say novels don't have any style, they're just ordinary prose, written in ordinary language. And uh, he thinks that this is this, the fact that formalism couldn't handle the novel, couldn't engage with it, couldn't even interpret its style, proves to be the limits of formalism and why it's a bad project. So he says, stylistics is concerned not with living discourse, but with a histological specimen made from it, with abstract linguistic discourse in the service of an artist's individual creative powers. But these individual tendentious overtones of style cut off from the fundamentally social modes in which discourse lives inevitably come across as flat and abstract in such a formulation that cannot therefore be studied in organic unity with the work's semantic components. Now I hope you're getting some Longinot vibes, early Longinot, right? That this idea that knowledge is fundamentally social, you can't just look at the word to world relation. We have to be looking at the social interactions between scientists and people using the language. Um, okay, so what is the problem with stylistics? So it presupposes that an artistic work is gonna have some kind of stylistic unity. That there is a style that we can study. And this is exemplified in poetry. A poem has a style, and that particular style can be used to determine the meaning of a word relative to the language of the time. Um, but this kind of analytic method breaks down when it comes to the novel, because the formalist uh, method of stylistics just can't provide an analysis of the, of the novel, because the novel has all kinds of different styles combined within it. So there's a bunch of different variations of style in the novel. There's no stylistic unity. Uh, and so you can't unify it by means of style or it can't be unified stylistically. So the novel as a whole is a phenomenon multiform in style. And the, the investigator is confronted with several heterogeneous stylistic unities often located on different linguistic levels subject to different stylistic controls. So he gives examples of this. Um, you might have like the narrator or the direct authorial sort of literary artistic narration, and that comes in lots of different ways, right? We have different kinds of narrators in novels. Sometimes it's supposed to be the subjective God's eye view, sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's someone that you think is reliable that within the novel you learn is not reliable, an unreliable narrator. So there's, uh, you've got stylization of the forms of oral everyday narration. So different speakers might talk differently in the, and so like in a poem where you use one deviation to get your poem, there's all kinds of different deviations in the novel and the way that different speakers speak and how they're speaking to each other. Um, you've got various forms of written narration, right? You might have diary entries. These are all stylized. There's uh, extra artistic statements. So within the novel, there might be like moral laws, like, I mean, he's thinking of Dostoevsky, right? But like these like moral or dogmatic claims that the characters are wrestling with, they're a different kind of speech act. Um, and then you've got the speech of the characters, so there's all these different kinds of style happening in a novel. So what is the style of a novel? The problem is pluralism. But Bakhtin thinks that the novel is still a kind of unity. It's just one stylistics can't accommodate. That's not the place to find the unity. So what he says is these heterogeneous stylistic unities upon entering the novel combine to form a structured artistic system and are subordinated to the higher stylistic unity of the work as a whole a unity that cannot be identified with any single one of the unities subordinated to it. The stylistic uniqueness of the novel as a genre consists precisely in the combination of these subordinated yet still relatively autonomous unities, even at times comprised of different languages, so really incommensurable, into the higher unity of the work as a whole. The style of a novel is to be found in the combination of its styles. The language of a novel is the system of its languages. So that's what I think is kind of the key. So on the formalist view of stylistics, we have some standard language that we, and we analyze style by its relation, the relation of the poetic language to standard language. But in the novel, these relations are just all over the place, right? You've got all kinds of different relations to this standard. Uh, and there's no way to sort of systematically say, this is the one that counts, or this is the style, so on and so forth. So what do you do? 
Um, well, Bakhtin thinks that the style really emerges from the interesting combination that you get of those different styles interacting with each other, right? Like what you get is a novel. And the unity of the novel is coming from its ability to sort of preserve and show those interactions. I mean, think about the way that you get this in art, like when you're, you know, if you're watching a movie or something, and you, the viewer, knows that two people in the room know something and the third person doesn't know, you know, and then maybe the fourth person doesn't know anything. And that's creating this kind of like tension for you as a viewer that's built on the interrelations of these kind of different characters. And that's in some sense what Bakhtin is thinking is going through the whole novel that, yeah, you've got these separate styles and you cannot unify them stylistically, but there's still something else that emerges, this other kind of creative work, um, this other kind of knowledge through discourse that we get only when we juxtapose these together. So uh, also PS, there is no standard language. Um, so what's driving all of this in the background is this idea of heteroglossia. And so literally that means different tongues, but for Bakhtin, he thinks this kind of multiplicity in language goes all the way down. So he doesn't think that there's like an ordinary dialect and then different versions of the dialect. He thinks he talks about, you know, take some national language like French or something that's going to be treated differently by people of different social classes. It's going to be treated differently informally and formally, and it's going to evolve at different times. And Bakhtin doesn't think that you pick any of those strands and say, that's the right language. He thinks that the language is this living thing. It's the interaction of these different dialogues that people are having and the exchanges between them that are sort of generating the living, the living language. There's no fundamental level. All right. So that was the rabbit hole. So you might be asking yourself, okay, okay, uh, what does this have to do with science? Well, recall the modeling problem. Um, how do we make sense of a situation where we have non-eliminable pluralism and models that just disagree? Maybe what we should do is use a novel approach to this scientific landscape, right? So what if we try to derive scientific knowledge from the way these multiple independent voices interact with each other and look for some kind of knowledge that comes from that systematic juxtaposition of the different views? Uh, Note that on this view, they remain autonomous. So this, this is, they're still different. Um, but what we want is something that comes from an exchange of those different types. So something like the social relations between the models, or you get models bumping up against each other to produce this other kind of knowledge that isn't just adequacy for a purpose, or you do you, everyone doing their own thing. Okay, example. So what are you talking about? So one thing that I have in mind is actually a literature review on this topic of global warming and the, the Permian Triassic event. And what you get in these literature reviews is they present all of the evidence within the frameworks that it's formed and the way that it kind of conflicts with each other, right? And then try to summarize the state of the field at the end. So, uh, I mean, this is just an example. Don't worry, I'm not gonna read this, but this is about the, exchange between the 2008 study and the 2012 study. Both of these are, this one focusing on it from the perspective of the 2008 study, and this focuses on it from the perspective of the 2012 study, right? And so they're both still in there. They're both a part of the like evolving scientific state of field. Um, they're not just relegated to their, you know, we are the EMIC modelers, we talk to the EMIC modelers or something like that. You are getting crosstalk and you're getting crosstalk aimed at solving a very specific unified scientific question. People want, they think they take themselves to be investigating the same thing, which is what happened in the Permian Triassic event. Um, so it does seem like there's crosstalk and both models are playing an important role in how scientists assess the field, what we take our knowledge to be. And they don't confirm or disconfirm each other, but they kind of mark out the limits, right? They show weaknesses and contrasts. And uh, so if you look like, um, at number three, they're saying the couple of the AOGCMs that I was talking about, that's the way that we're going to facilitate model data comparison. But then at the same time, we need these emics to do the open system, time continuous simulations. Those are important too, but maybe we're not grasping everything in them. Can we develop them a little bit in this way? But we're holding these all as knowledge devices that are shared together as a way of knowing about the same thing. So I see this as a kind of dialogue of incommensurables. 
And if you look back to Longino in 2013, she said that non-eliminative pluralism is an attitude towards plurality of incommensurables, an attitude focusing on the different kinds of knowledge each approach can offer, rather than assuming that one at most is correct. So, you know, I read her, I do think that she's kind of thinking of this every uh, every pot has a lid approach. <laughs> you know, like we just have different kinds of sciences, let them do their thing, they'll answer the questions they're interested in. But I think you can also read her as, as or I read her, I take this to say like, yeah, um, we should focus on the different kinds of knowledge that they produce, focus on all of that at once. <laughs> and focusing on those together can give us this other kind of knowledge, which is knowledge that emerges from the kind of knowledge of a field. So uh, when we put these approaches together, we get this novel scientific workspace where the relationship between these various kinds of approaches, even if existing in wholly different languages or causal spaces, uh, still dialogically influence each other, producing shared rather than independent knowledge. Um, and I think you can save something like transformative criticism. Uh, so you get a redux of this, right? So originally you get public venues for criticism. Now we've got public venues for critical dialogue and exchanges across methodologies. And I'm thinking of conferences and stuff like literature review and literature exchanges. Before you get uptake of criticism, uptake of criticism is always gonna be less direct if you're dealing incommensurably, but I'll talk about what I think that kind of looks like. Um, I don't think it might be direct uptake, but you get a kind of boundary setting or an awareness of the limits of different kinds of views. Uh, and also, I mean, sometimes, you do. Well, maybe I think I have this in a slide somewhere. There is like more direct uptake. So there's also standards about, so before you have these publicly recognized standards for evaluating a theory, how do you do that when our approaches are so different? Well, I think it's something like standards about what the strengths and weaknesses of different approaches are, right? That's what I was showing in the literature review, like a sense of what's really reliable about this, what's less reliable about this, what are the parts to focus on? Um, and the tempered equality, that we still need. Right. And that kind of diversity is often what motivates having a lot of different approaches. And when you're dealing with a really complex phenomenon, the more approaches, the better. So diversity is still going to play into our ability to get better knowledge in the long run. All right. So um, know that this is not, this is me hand waving towards conclusions with art. So this is not aimed at an objective standard because originally with transformative criticism, it's like, oh, we're going to dialogue and then we get to the objective standard. So what are we getting to? Well, I think we get to this kind of shared way of balancing approaches, right? We're trying to get a good view of the scientific landscape, which I think is illustrated in art that thinks about balance in terms of color, because color can be kind of like, I think of these the different incommensurable views, but what we're trying to do is hold them together in one space in a way that we share something like our shared scientific metacognition or something, right? We're, so we're holding the views in this kind of tension together and transformative criticism aims to get the right kind of balance between the views. And so I have, I like, this is a Mondrian. I really like this painting because of this commentary I read on it by uh, Sister Wendy Beckett, who's like the Oxford educated nun from the BBC that drives around doing all this art stuff. But talking about this painting, she's like, you know, it's the epitome of balance because you look at it and it's great, but imagine moving a line or changing a color or blocking something out, you get a totally different painting, right? It really changes the dynamics of the painting. And so that shows you the artistic tension and the importance of getting it right. So I think that's our aim with transformative criticism, not the subjective standard, a shared map of the scientific landscape. And we see that as a kind of juxtaposition, right? Like why do we need juxtaposition? What does it do in art? Again, the approaches can only be understood when they're set against other approaches. That's kind of how juxtaposition works in art. And the contrast brings a kind of clarity. So it helps us understand each individual approach by knowing it's like limits and bounds and how it looks against a different approach. Um, there might be partial integrations. So uh, there was another AOGCM before the 2008 EMIC where they did something like the wind gut and wind gut, but it was like an earlier version of that. And the EMIC model uses that to set their initial conditions when they run their model. So there's some dialogue between the models. Um, and I think of that as the kind of bleeding lines sometimes when you have your juxtaposition, right? So you have these different kinds of relations between models. You have different models that aren't, they might be incommensurable, but putting them against each other's juxtaposition is important to bring knowledge. Um, and it's different than adequacy for a purpose, because it's not just like, well, figure out what you want to do and then find your approach. 
And I think of this as a kind of scientific heteroglossia, right? The constant competing of theories that all together are giving us a picture, the scientific picture of the world. And I think that this really leads to scientific progress. So this is a report from 20, I think this is 2021. But one thing that has come after this is the thought that maybe there's two different triggers going on here for the mass extinction. Like maybe it's not one extinction event and uh, the Eusinia one came later, which is why they think that the data maybe was matching up better in the long running um, model because they think there was a secondary event that was caused by Noxia that wouldn't have been noticeable in the early years of the Permian-Triassic event. And so I think that that, but this shows where it's important to hold these different tensions together in science, in science because you kind of have this nice overused real quote, but I'm always a big fan of this quote, the idea that you have to be patient with those unsolved questions and continue holding them, right? That part of what science needs to do is draw attention to the place where we have tensions and disagreement, because I think that's often the fruitful places to produce new research. And so we have to stay in those tensions rather than try to too quickly resolve them by collapsing and favoring one approach or another. And you know, if you're doing it right, I think you live into that answer and then that answer brings you into new scientific questions and the need for a new scientific landscape. So that's it. We'll take a short break, a few minutes, and then we'll convene for questions. I didn't do that. 